My name is George English. I'm the director of research through people. Once upon a time, 400 years ago, about 100 people boarded a ship to go to the New World, little knowing what a dreadful next few months they would have and what an enormous impact they would have on the whole of Western civilization. This year, 2020, is the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower sailing to America. Like all of our ancestors, they lived through history, and I hope to bring those events to life for you. We've probably all heard of the Mayflower, but how much do you know about it? So I'd like to pose one or two questions. Who was on the Mayflower? What did they do? When did they go? Where did they go to? Why did they go? And how? Do you know why they went? They felt driven to leave where they came from and were attracted by where they went to. Was the Mayflower the only ship? In fact, no, there's another ship involved and the whole story connected with that. We hear about the pilgrims and the religion and so on. Were they all religious pa passengers, religious people? In fact, over half of those on the ship were not religious pilgrims. And there's reasons why the other people were on board to make the voyage feasible. <laughs> and if you were planning this trip, you're going to go to a, the new world, no housing or anything else. When would you like to get there? Spring, early summer? Yes. That's not when they went, not what happened to them. And the consequences were dire. So we're going to break this down into five parts, about 10 minutes each. Um, and it's a story that lasts more than 500 years. It starts more than 100 years before they actually left. And you would have heard of the Reformation. We'll talk about that. And the people on the Mayflower wanted to separate from the Church of England. We'll then talk about the voyage itself. And then the pilgrims and how they got on afterwards and their effect on the whole of Western civilization. Uh, <clears throat> many aspects of this. The potato and tobacco were things that came along because of this, part of our staple diet and things that have made a big difference to us. Um, parts of the story are far-fetched. If you read it in a novel, you'd think, no, that, 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 that's just not believable. But it did happen. Um, and so I hope you'll find this very interesting. And like genealogy, what we want to do is be informed, objective and balanced in what we do. So the Reformation, and this statement is worth considering. We've vaguely heard of the Reformation, the religious changes, but it wasn't just religion. It was the whole effect on the social unity of countries, not just in Britain, but in various European countries that was the most significant development in the 16th century. And we need to understand the time by looking at this Reformation. Religion wasn't a matter of personal preference. It was the very basis of society. And those who went on the Mayflower, this was what caused them to leave. <clears throat> so if we look at the a map of Europe in the 16th century, the countries weren't the same as now necessarily. Um, there was no Germany, it was the German Empire. The Netherlands or Low Countries, which we now know as Holland and Belgium, were then just 17 provinces <clears throat> ruled by Spain. So let's look at the events that happened uh, and they affected most European countries. Italy in 1500 controlled the Catholic religion, the Roman Catholic religion, which was pursued in virtually all the countries we're looking at here. Spain was then the most powerful country in Europe and ruled the Netherlands. <clears throat> and the event that started this in many ways, is Christopher Columbus discovering the new world in 1492. <clears throat> the saying is that he didn't know where he was going when he went. When he got there, he didn't know where he was. And when he came back, he didn't know where he had been. But that's where the pilgrims would eventually head to. The other big event was in 1517, Martin Luther nailed up 95 theses on the church door in Wittenberg near Berlin. And basically these were protesting about a lot of the Catholic church practices, like indulgences where if you've done something wrong, 
say you're sorry, pay us an amount of money and we'll give you an indulgence and forgiveness for that. And that had an amazing effect. It spread very quickly, both positively and negatively, leading to the Protestant religion. The southern countries like Spain and Italy stayed Catholic. The northern ones, a lot of them went Protestant. Um, and another key influencer in this was Calvin, the Protestant Puritan religion. He was based in Geneva. Now, England for the 16th century was mainly ruled by two monarchs, Henry VIII in the first half of the century, Queen Elizabeth in the second half of the century. And in between, there was a five or six spell by Edward, Henry's son that he finally had, and Mary. And Mary was Catholic, so England went from Protestant, from Catholic to Protestant, back to Catholic, and then under Elizabeth went to Protestant again. Scotland went Protestant fairly quickly in 1560. France persecuted the Huguenots, and later on they would come. And refugees came from these countries. Spain persecuted the Protestants in the Netherlands. A lot of them came across to England. Now, the pilgrims that we know of, they were actually living in a part of North Nottinghamshire, the centre of England, spinning briefly over into Yorkshire and Lincolnshire. But the pilgrims who actually were the main focus of those who went on the Mayflower were from a small part of England. And eventually they wanted to separate from the Church of England. And they didn't go straight to America. They firstly went across to a place called Leiden in Holland, where they would spend a dozen or so years. And the reason they went to Leiden was by that time, the Dutch Republic, which we now know as Holland, had declared independence. And Leiden was then a more peaceful place where the pilgrims could hopefully pursue their religion. But eventually they got dissatisfied. And in 1620, as we now know, they boarded the ship, the Mayflower, and went across to America. So we're going to cover these happenings uh, over the piece and what happened to various people, including obviously the pilgrims on the Mayflower. Now, if we look at England at that time, um, every monarch had things that happened that, that affected people. If you were living in a village in Nottinghamshire at that time, uh, things would happen nearby that you would know about far away, but they would affect things and they'd affect your children and your grandchildren, leading eventually to perhaps your grandchild leaving that village and eventually going to America. So Henry VII was the King of England when Columbus discovered America, and he was followed by his son, Henry VIII. And Henry VIII, three of his children became King or Queen of England. His son, Edward VII, who he finally had some 30 years after he became become King, his daughter Mary, by Catherine of Aragon, then took over. She was Catholic and was known as Bloody Mary because of the uh, persecution of Protestants. But she died after five years and then Queen Elizabeth became queen and she was queen for 45 years. And then in 1603, the King of Scotland, James VI, but also became the King of England because he was a descendant of Henry VII. And... Um, so England and Scotland then had joint sovereignty. Now, I mentioned earlier Luther and Calvin, who were the key influence of the Reformation. So in 1500, most of Europe was Roman Catholic, but there was a lot of pressure for reform. And Luther was one of these who nailed up these theses protesting about the Catholic practices. And this started to inspire the Protestant Reformation. So he had an influence, but probably the biggest influence was by John Calvin, and he started in the mid 1530s, and his influence developed from Geneva, where he lived in Switzerland. And Calvinism was a very strict form of Protestantism. Now, John Knox will be well known to those in Scotland. He went to Geneva when uh, Calvin was there and was very much influenced by him. And 1559, he then went to Scotland. And in 1560, Scotland followed Calvinism, called it Presbyterianism. In England, this was the Puritans, so the strictest form of um, 
Britain in England was that. And we will see that the those on the Mayflower were in fact Puritans. Now here's Henry VIII, an imposing figure. We know a lot about him and his six wives and so forth. But in 1509, he became king and he was married to his brother's widow, Catherine of Aragon, who was the aunt of Charles V of Spain. And then they didn't have any sons to follow him as an heir. And finally, in 1830, 1534, Henry VIII, in order to divorce his wife, split from Rome and the Catholic Church. The Spanish were persecuting refugees in the Low Countries who were Protestants, and Henry VIII allowed them to settle in England. And then he started to dissolve the monasteries. He realized <laughs> the Catholic Church had more money than he did. And this amazing, far-reaching dissolution of the monasteries took place throughout England. And finally, he was followed by his son, Edward VI, but Edward was only nine. So the country was run by protectors, Thomas Cranmer in particular, and they spread Protestantism throughout England. And John Knox, mentioned earlier, he, in fact, was in England for five years while Edward VI uh, was on the throne. And in 1550, the first so-called Stranger's Church was set up to, in French or Dutch, the language that the refugees from the Low Countries spoke so they could have their own religion and their own ceremonies. But then in 1553, Queen Mary became queen and she turned England Catholic again. And it's known as Bloody Mary because of the persecution of Protestants then. And many Protestants like John Knox left the country. And she married Philip II of Spain, who was the son of Charles V, but was also her first cousin once removed. And the interesting thing we'll find out later, if she had lived, then Philip II would have been effectively the King of England. And that would have made a big difference perhaps in history. But she was followed by Elizabeth, the daughter of Anne Boleyn, who, as we know, Henry VIII had beheaded. And she turned England Protestant again, but tried to follow and find a middle way whereby there wouldn't be constant persecution between the Protestants and the Catholics. Mary, Queen of Scots, who is well known, uh, was um, a victim of Queen Elizabeth. And finally, she beheaded her in 1587. In 1588, Philip II sent the Spanish Armada to conquer England, which perhaps he wouldn't have needed to have done if uh, he had carried on as king with Queen Mary. And then in 1603, James VI of Scotland became King of England. He banned private religious meetings. And by this time, those on the um, Mayflower, the separatists, were holding private meetings. And as they were banned, this increased their desire to leave England. We also know about the gunpowder plot through Firework Day every year now. That was a plot by the Catholics. So we've introduced the subject and set up the scene for why the separatists did what they did. Um, I hope you found that interesting and please come back next time for part two, the Mayflower and the separatists. Thank you.